Morning, Chris. Good morning. How's it going? It is going well. How are you today? Oh, doing pretty good. Good. Um, anything you need from me? No, I think I am. Good to you're go. automatically a you're automatically a host or co-host, right? Oh, uh, yep, I think so. Along with your elk back there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Playing with the virtual setting. Wow. Nice looking elks. Yeah. Pixabay. <laughs> So do you want me to um, monitor the chat, right? Um, anything else? Uh, do you want to have me introduce you? You want to introduce yourself? What do you want to do there? Uh, up to you, however you want to do it. It's fine. Um, well, I'll let you introduce yourself because you know more about you than I do. So <laughs> <laughs> how's that sound? That sounds fine. I don't think if we, ever, if we had did little bios or not. I don't think we did. Uh, that's a good point. I'm not sure we did. I don't remember if we did. Probably put that up on our site, don't you think? Yeah, if we did. <laughs> I think we have. I'm. Uh, I'm admitting. Uh, I'm admitting <laughs> people into the room now. So. Alrighty. I have someone who wants to join by the name of Dad and Mom. <laughs> Should I remove that? I do not know. <laughs> I'm going to say yes. I'm going to remove them. So how'd your sessions go today? Uh, just the morning session went pretty well, I think. Yeah. We got a, a lot of folks there this morning, so that's yeah, good. We just got to get Kay to be a little more enthused, you know? She's just, yeah. so, <laughs> just so quiet, you know? <laughs> well, I'll monitor the chat, and uh, if questions come up, do you want me just to answer them if I can, or do you want to wait till the end to answer them? Uh, we can probably wait till the... Well, I'll probably answer them as they come up, I think. Um, I'll try to monitor the chat as well. Okay. Um, everyone's coming in. Ah, hey, Frederick. Seeing some familiar names. <laughs> Good morning. Using the my iPad app, and it's hard to figure out how to unmute myself and, yeah. <laughs> and participate in this thing. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Chris, do you want me to mute everybody once you get going? Uh, sure, we can do that. And All then right. um, I can unmute at the end or something. Yeah, we can be at the end for questions. All right. Oh, it looks like I need to get the uh, screen share ability. So you might need to. Uh, you should be able to have that as a host, right? Or... Yeah, it's, uh, it's still saying the host has disabled it. So I think you have to make me a presenter. Uh, let's see. I'm going to click on this to see if that works. There. I think you're sharing yours. Yep. I think you got to find me in participants and then. There you are. Bump me up. <laughs> well, I see you. Uh, make you a host or a co-host? Co-host? Uh, co let's do co-host, yeah. All right. Okay, you should be oh, co-host. There we go. Huh? You yep. good? It changed it up now. There we go. All right. I get to move all my 
the advantage of having dual screens <laughs> to move everything over. <laughs> I'm uh, I don't know. <laughs> Some of the uh, participants logins are unique. Um, I don't know. Should I just go ahead and admit everybody or? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just like, it's, it's, that's one of the things it's like, well, you know, some of them have S numbers, which is fine. Yeah, those um, are okay. Those are obviously, yeah, those are, yeah, anything with an S number. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be somebody from the system, the Colorado uh, Community College system. Okay. That's their normal, um, uh, that's our normal identifying number. <laughs> I was a little hesitant with a the third employee dad. number. The the other ones, I, I'm just wondering if people just uh, modified, like the like the one you're talking about, the one that said like mom and dad. Sometimes people just have their they may not know how to rename, so they they use Zoom for a family member, and they didn't necessarily uh, rename it for the conference. So that might well, be something with that. Too late now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> That'll teach them. Yeah. <laughs> my bad oh no no worries <laughs> is uh hey, Kate, Kate. is she co-presenting with you or is she are you Kate? do you want to co-present well we got about <laughs> uh we got about two minutes before we start so uh I'll keep uh, <laughs> I'll keep admitting people. Kay uh, has a Kay has a well next to our question there, Chris. <laughs> do you do you want to be able to provide side commentary? That's that's a real question for Kay. Is <laughs> and since we're doing blockchain, I probably should shift to this background. There you go. Since we'll be very much in the matrix. <laughs> Sure, I'm I'm always up for side commentary. <laughs> Keeps things interesting. So according to my watch, we got a couple minutes left. Is that the time you got as well, Chris? Uh yes, that's what I'm looking. I'll give you a, I'll give you the countdown once we get close. Uh, looks like uh, you'll have to uh, bumper up to co-present, co-host. Oh, for K? Yeah. It's interesting. Does it let me? Let me see if I can find her. There she is. Click. And she is now co-host. <laughs> Okay, so I'll try out audio. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Now I'm deciding on, on video or not. I'm like, but I have this granola bar here that I want to eat. <laughs> you, can, you can munch and, and have you your video off. <laughs> okay, <That's fine>. okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just checking to see if I can mute and unmute. I, it seems like I can do that. Cool. Always good ah, to have a second yeah, did you see the uh, did you see the numbers? I'm not sure what we went to for the keynote. It, I know the highest number I saw was 211. Yeah, that's what I saw. That's um, a good number. Yeah, that 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 is a good number. <laughs> and I'm like, it would have been, you know, it would have been bad if <laughs> all 211 people could have gotten on audio at any point in time. Made a quick bit.ly for the slides in case the uh, screen is a little too small for you or uh, well Chris it looks later. as though it is the bewitching hour so it um, is I'm going to <laughs> go ahead yeah, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody um, so for those attending welcome um, we have a chat uh, option. So um, if you would like to ask questions uh, as we go through this, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I'll monitor those questions. Chris will obviously have to answer those questions because uh, <laughs> I will not probably be able to. Uh, so welcome to our uh, 
11 o'clock mountain session with uh, Chris. Uh, and the topic today is blockchain 101. I'm going to hand it over to Chris for his introduction and we're off and running. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. My name is Chris Lutz, and I will be presenting as, as Greg mentioned. Looks like I got muted. Okay, now I'm back. So uh, yeah. We don't want to mute you. <laughs> he had us muted for a while. Um, anyway, um, and so that one I just did based on, like, the table of contents that I can see, but we don't have the book yet. Uh, participants, if you can place yourself on mute, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Oh. All right. Okay. Looks like we're all good. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. So first of all, uh, just a real quick key points here. We're just looking to describe what blockchain is. Uh, talk about blockchain-based technologies and sort of discuss how you might want to talk, start talking about blockchain with your administrators. So uh, how would folks rate their knowledge about blockchain? Go ahead and use the chat if you would like uh, and go ahead and Okay, so more than most, fairly informed, new stuff, zero. <laughs> tiny, tiny, nothing, very basic, next to nothing, very basic, all right. Okay. <laughs> uh, someone has a ringer. <laughs> I have a daughter who works for Accenture. <laughs> well done. Uh, so really, when we're, we're looking at, at, at blockchain, first of all, it's a, it's a technology. Uh, and so um, that's one of the things that this, this presentation is going to go start out at a, you know, I'm going to try to start out at a, at a lower level. If, if I'm not starting out at a low enough level, feel free to let me know uh, in, in the chat uh, and, and I, will, I will go ahead and, and uh, stop and, uh, and, and try to explain it a little bit better. And uh, if you already know a lot about it, uh, probably at the end, uh, it'll probably get more interesting for you. Uh, but uh, first, next thing we're gonna kick off is, uh, one of the things we're gonna talk a lot about is math. And uh, this is one of my favorite quotes uh, for anybody who has um, read the Laundry Files. Uh, do we have any uh, Strauss, Charles Strauss fans or Laundry File fans in the audience? I'll let you go ahead and read that. And this really is, is how a lot of our students at a community college level, uh, where I work, I work with, at the community college level here in Colorado at CCC Online. I oversee math as well as career and technical education. And a lot of our students really do look at math as magic. And they really look at it as, as how do we, you know, we, it's, it's a little black box. I, I go ahead and I type it in my calculator or I type it in my phone. Uh, and which disappears with my virtual background. Uh, and I go ahead and I get a number and, and that number should be the answer. And so this idea of math is magic and it really sort of comes to the forefront when we start talking about technology, we start talking about blockchain, when we start talking about these concepts where we start dealing a lot with ideas that we're gonna talk about today like uh, encryption, like algorithms. 
these, these computational ideas. And so the idea here is, and of course, you know, where else can you get other than uh, Strauss, the idea of and who else here might be an applied computational demonologist? Uh, so <laughs> always a fun thing. So we're gonna start off uh, relatively, really quickly. And really when you start talking about blockchain, the first place to start is you start talking about Bitcoin. And so uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, we're gonna start talking a little bit about currency. So when we talk about currency, we're talking about money. We're talking about, you know, in, in monetary terms or fiscal terms, we're talking about fiat currency. So paper currency, think of your dollar bill, think about your $20 bill, your $5 bill. This is paper. Uh, it, we're not, no one's, well, I don't think anyone's really carrying around any gold. Uh, anymore. We're not carrying around chests of gold. We're not carrying around chests of silver. We're not carrying around any precious metals um, or diamonds to exchange uh, for goods, though COVID might change that. Who knows? Uh, so, but the idea is, is we're using credit cards. We're using digital transactions. We're using cash. We're using fiat currency. So the idea is it's tied to that value of that currency. How do we value it? What is a dollar? What is $5? What is $10? Well, all that's tied to credit worthy of the government that is behind that monetary, that's behind that money. It represents stored value. So Chris, what you're trying to say is um, money, money at, at one point used to be gold, and but then we decided that something else would represent it, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and, and then we said paper works well. Paper, and now, and what then we went saying, with colorful paper because of how we found out that other people could take our paper and copy our paper, but we didn't so, like that. And so we made but, our paper more complicated. And what we're saying now is, oh, we're going past paper and now we're going to... Virtual currency, which is very similar. Digital representation of value issued by private developers and denominated their own union of account. And so this is when we start getting into and how we got made our way into cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin. Uh, and so sort of the gateway to sort of move that way actually was games. Uh, a lot of games really sort of started out this whole movement towards virtual currencies. Uh, you had games like EverQuest, games like World of Warcraft, games like EVE Online that created their own virtual currencies in game that players could trade, that players could use to purchase goods. And again, these developed gaming companies develop these units of money so for, for players to go ahead and trade and to um, exchange values and goods. And so this chart here uh, from He uh, et al. Uh, does a really good job of sort of summarizing all the different currencies that you, when you get past your tangible cash based currencies. You have digital, uh, you have virtual, you have convertible, you have decentralized, and then you start getting into cryptocurrencies. Yeah, yes, Webkins! <laughs> exactly. And so that's what you start seeing. You start seeing how do you, you, you go ahead and pull through this, the, these, these tenures. So then you start seeing this whole idea of of currencies and so cryptocurrencies is really sort of especially bitcoin is really where blockchain got started so again the what the values the what determines the value of the currency demand perception or belief of value and trust are really sort of the three main things that really are tied to value that are really tied to the value or how much a currency is worth now in normal, in our normal monetary in the US, we have clearing houses. It could be the central bank. It could be looking at uh, check clearing houses for whatever, you, for those of you that still write checks. Uh, you also have your credit card companies, they're clearing houses. Uh, you have uh, various federal reserves, they're clearing houses for the cash and coins that go in and out of circulation. You have lots of different things that go on. But what happens whenever we start looking at 
uh, these virtual currencies. Well, in the early stages, we started coming up with the perceiving of how might we might come up with virtual currencies. Uh, you have Zebo here who came up with talking about God protocols. And the idea behind God protocols is that when you have various users who don't know each other, you need to have a fair system. You need to have an unbiased third party that will not, that will not take sides and will be an honest broker and won't be somebody who will, uh, who, who, who will basically be trusted by everybody. And so Zabo uh, in, in the paper, in this paper looked at, called them God protocols. These are things that, um, how do we create a system that everyone can trust that keeps people's identities secret so that you don't know, so the actors don't know who's interacting with each other. So that way there's no way to bias that transaction. So another thing you get into when we start talking about cryptocurrencies and blockchain is this idea of distributed. And so this is a figure that really sort of gives you an idea from a Baran uh, of what's the difference that you see. So right now, what you, what you have is, is you have a very centralized, for most currencies, what we have is very centralized. So in the US, you use centralized, whether it's your credit card, whether it is your, your bank. So I should say, this is the ye olden days. Uh, in your gold, you had to go very one spot, your king did the currency or, your, or one centralized area, the baron, the land baron, whoever was there. Now we're using more of a decentralized model where individual branches of banks, you can go around, get your currency, make it easier to have access to. When you start talking about cryptocurrencies, you're now seeing distributed. And the idea is, is now we're broadening that net. And when it comes to Bitcoin, the idea in blockchain, We'll talk a little bit more about how that, that is distributed across the various users of the currency and how that is being used to also secure and create trust and how they protect that currency from corruption and it being hacked. So it's distributed. It's kept in sync by miners. So, uh, so how many of you have heard of, of Bitcoin miners? So many people are still looking at chat. <laughs> okay, a few people. All right. So these are what the miners are. There's just these little devices that you have. And uh, this is one person's device. Uh, you have uh, these four little, four little miners uh, are set up on a USB port here. And they're just plugged in. This is hooked up. Uh, this is just a USB fan to keep them cool. Uh, exactly, a business plan on Bit, uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, and so this is sort of what they mean by miner. So they're just using technology, these little, basically almost like thumb drives. Uh, and what they're doing is they're doing computations and they're doing calculations and they're trying to come up with solutions to be able, and if they get the correct, if they get the correct solution, uh, we'll talk about incentivization in a little bit, um, they get rewarded. Uh, and that's how you start earning uh, Bitcoins if you're a miner. So the other thing here is that you also have of real value. Um, and so again, it goes back to that other people wanting it, looking at perceiving value of how they're out of that demand, perceived value and trust that goes behind underneath the value. Uh, the map here shows bit nodes, I pulled this out last night. Uh, this is just a website that sort of shows you all the different nodes across the world of people who are still actively trading uh, and, just, and where are all the bit nodes uh, and how Bitcoin is distributed across the world. And you can see where all the hotspots are. And so the larger the circle, the darker the color, that sort of shows you where uh, everything is. Now, what, what are some of the things that you notice from this map? Yep, US, Europe, Asia. It's very concentrated in certain places. Why might that be? Trade. What, what do you think, oh, there's technology. So technology is there as well. Um, one of the key things for 
uh, virtual currency and, and cryptography or in cryptocurrencies is you really do need to have the access to relatively inexpensive computing power. <laughs> Don't trust government. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Chris, uh, you, ha you know, you did pull up, you did call, pull up the God protocol. Yes, so, yes, I did. <laughs> and and I I have a question for you, and sure. this is a linkage question. Um, okay, so block blockchain is to Bitcoin, how? So, so what, I guess the question I want answered is, why are you bothering to tell us about Bitcoin before we go into blockchain and education? Sure, because, because, blockchain, the other, because blockchain came about because of Bitcoin. So blockchain is the underlying technology um, of Bitcoin. So it's the, it's the guts. It's how, how Bitcoin could be offered. It's the actual infrastructure that allowed Bitcoin to actually happen. Uh, and most people are not familiar at all with, with, with blockchain, but because of the wide, wide coverage that Bitcoin received, because of, of the massive blow up, and then of course, because of the and the ups and down of the Bitcoin market for anyone who's invested in Bitcoin, uh, that, that, has, that has gotten a lot of people's attention. Uh, and so that's the reason why I use Bitcoin as the entry point for blockchain uh, is because most people are way more familiar with uh, the idea of Bitcoin than they are with blockchain. Good question. And feel free to go ahead and uh, type in your questions in chat as well. All right. So on to the reason why it's called blockchain. So why is it called blockchain? So really what it is, is a growing series of records. Initially, these are, these, are, these are called blocks. And each block contains an encrypted hash of a previous block, a timestamp, a timestamp and transaction data. Ah, yes. So when I say sync, what I mean is that we talked about the network being distributed. And so what that means is that everybody who is part of a blockchain has a copy of the entire blockchain. And that blockchain is decentralized. So everyone who's on that network all has a copy of it. And then at a predetermined time based on each blockchain, uh, say 10 minutes, every 15 minutes or whatever, that blockchain as a whole is updated. And what it is, is basically every time someone successfully completes a calculation, we'll get to that a little bit, then the entire chain will update. And uh, depending on how that chain is structured, that dictates what sort of updating, updating side they set up. So that's what I mean by keeping in sync. And so as those in case of Bitcoin, as those miners are trying to solve these various calculations, when someone solves it correctly and in the most efficient manner possible, then in addition to being rewarded, that also updates every, every, but everyone else's and everyone starts over onto the next problem. So that that resyncs everybody else. And so that's how the data keeps being refreshed and it also helps keeping things from being corrupted. So it's sort of a built-in uh, security measure. So blockchain is, is, is a technology. It's an algorithm, it uses algorithms, it's an encrypted database. The idea is there's keys, you as, as an, an individual, you get a private key, that's basically your password. And what it is, is as an owner of your data, you own it and you are allowed to give public keys to individuals that you wanna have access to your data. Yes, Clint, you could say that. It's, it's, a, it's a transaction. And so then um, it's a specific transaction. So whether, so say you made a purchase, that would be a block. If say a student took a course and every time the student, if, if, a, if a college purchased a blockchain solution, when the student registered or the student enrolled would create a block. When the student uh, dropped, added a course, 
would create a block. When the student dropped the course, would create a block. When the student re-enrolled, would create a block. <laughs> and so to keep building these little beads, these little chains of tracking every single transaction that's going on. And so another way to look at it, because I teach accounting, is look at it as like a ledger in accounting. So the idea behind the blockchain is that this records the transactions and nobody can change the transaction. So it is always going to be there and it tracks every single transaction. And it contains all activity or transactions in a given block that happens. And every transaction is timestamped. And so there is no, there's no, like I said, there's no refuting when it happens. When an, when an action occurs, it is timestamped and it is logged. So in the case of Bitcoin, it's, incentiv it's incentivized. So they distribute the computing load because it's a lot of computing. So they distribute it across the miners. And how they do that is they reward them with earning bitcoins because there's a set number of bitcoins that can be be mined that's how bitcoins get freed up to be traded uh, between those that are trading currency the bitcoin currency uh, miners have to go find the bitcoins through doing wide number of computations and they use a distributed peer-to-peer -peer networking model so um, so, uh, so those that uh, went ahead and did Sansar, or if you're involved in any of the Foldit models or any of the things that are out there for like, uh, there's a couple models out there now that use your free computing time. Uh, instead of a screensaver, uh, you're helping try to, to find uh, protein binders for uh, COVID. There's a lot of different these types of peer networking models. They're all distributed models, so uh, blockchain is very similar. And so when it comes down to it, a lot of this is goes around encryption. A lot of this is solving cryptographic puzzles and you get some money because everyone likes money. Uh, at least that's what it comes to when you're incentivizing. So the biggest thing is trust. How do you trust? How do you find out and keep, the, keep trust and how do you build in uh, and making sure everyone is not, no one's trying to go ahead and fake the system or hack the system or corrupt the system? How do you build that trust? And so first of all, um, the really focus on is permissionless. The idea is that information cannot be accessed unless a key is given. So you don't know who you are helping or who is helping you. So the idea is, is that this is a very double blind type of thing. You can't see who you're helping. They can't see who they're helping. And so the idea is all you have is a key. You just have information. And so trust is via mass collaboration and encryption. Uh, so so the, again, so again, so this information from the users aren't being shared between each other. All you get is a key. Um, it's a little different when you're actually doing it, like if you're doing a, a buy seller type of transaction, because obviously you'll know that, hey, I'm the buyer, you're the seller. But when it comes to these type of trust protocols in the mining side, the minor and, and, the, and Bitcoin, it's again, it's a closed, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's a permissionless interaction. So how does this all work? The answer is encryption, ah! uh, which is basically quick, complex, expensive if you're not in a technology advanced country uh, and computing. So it's math, it's lots and lots and lots of math. Um, what the, the term we use, uh, the term they use in blockchain is hashing. And so this is the fundamental process of blockchain. And what it is, is Bitcoin uses uh, a, a, a 256 bit hash. Um, and the idea behind this is that it takes a string of any length. So string is just programming language. So it could be numbers, it could be text. Uh, and basically you enter it, you put your input in, and no matter what it is, it spits out a 256 bit length output hash. And so you see that down here at the bottom. So even though they don't line up the same, <laughs> in, this, in this example, it's more because of 
the width of the letters and the numbers aren't the same. And so that's why the two at the bottom don't look exactly the same, but they are two, both 256 bits in length. Uh, and you can see that it's the, it's the same type of input, but the hashes are totally different. And so that's the whole idea is that you put information in, so the transaction is coded and then it's encrypted and the hashing uh, is, is that process. And this is sort of the piece that strings those blocks together. So each transaction is a block and then the hashing helps knit everything together. So what do we mean by 256-bit uh, encryption? Well, that means there's two to the 256 power possible combinations. So this means there's 1.1579 times 10 to the 70 total combinations uh, of possible solutions. So again, that math, that computing power, I warned you there would be math. Uh, <laughs> so for context, 1 billion is 1 times 10 to the ninth power. So, so, so what you're saying, Chris, is that, is that, you know, if we say it's like the matrix or, or what did you have? Computational demonology. That, yes, that, <laughs> that's exactly what it's like. And, and it does this so it can't be cheated, right? Well, it does this for, for several reasons. Number one is for security measures. So it's, it really does make it so there's, it's very difficult to, to cheat. Um, it makes it very difficult uh, to, um, to, to, to break the system. Uh, the other piece to it is that um, it does require the computing power. That's why, it, that's why you saw in the bit notes map is very concentrated to countries that had very strong internet, had very strong uh, technology infrastructures, and had relatively cheap electricity to run all of that computing power. Um, the the thing here is that that yes there is this this uses a, a lot of of complex calculations um yes you may summon a many angled one as uh, charles strass likes to put it uh if you're a call a cthulhu person uh yes you may send a, a many uh, a many tentacled old one as well by accident uh but the idea here is that this this is sort of the key crux of what goes on with this this uh, encryption piece, and sort of this is how the hashes work. So, what you have is you have your individual transactions down here, and so you have a hash that's created, and so sort of you have your your individual blocks. And so what happens is when you sort of create your block, you sort of combine a hash from each transaction. So you see they get combined. This creates this portion of a hash of transaction zero of, of text zero, text one. Then this becomes text two, text three. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Taylor. <laughs> and that forms a text root. And then you see the block contains the previous hash. So it builds off of the previous block. It includes a timestamp, it has a text root, you have a nonce in there to, add, to mix things up. The nonce is just a, a extra information to help, uh, help with the encryption. And then it feeds into the rest of the blockchain. And so the hashing is, again, it's that piece that knits the whole, the whole blockchain together. And uh, there's plenty of literature out there on hashing. Uh, I, I, like I said, I definitely do not want to, um, <laughs> to to spend a lot yeah, of time going over it because we could spend the whole presentation on just on hashing. It is fun. It is lots and lots of fun. It is something to yeah, <laughs> not that type of hashing killer, but yeah, uh, but it is Colorado, so yeah, it could be. But it's <laughs> a lot of fun. Uh, yes, Clint, great, great, great point, Clint. Um, that sense of security behind two fifty six encryption is is great until quantum computing happens. Quantum computing gives people, would give people the ability to uh, basically go ahead and do two to the 70, I think it was at 72nd, um, 
processes every uh, every fraction of a second, something like that, then you start getting into quantum encryption. Now we're talking lots of fun. Now you're talking really fun numbers. You start you start really having fun. Yeah. And so I, was, I was I was just going to interject. Um, uh, we were asked if the slides will go up. We'll put the we'll put the link to the slides like underneath this on the schedule, and, and to let everybody know in case in case you'd like to go back to like um, the beginning steps of this. We we went ahead and um, we did a book club on this. So from the very mm -hmm. basics that you can you can go and you can find resources there if you want. We we did it like in 2016. We went from anything from like intro videos and and other things. If you're an educator, if you want to get that. Now, if you want to talk quantum computing, don't go to our book club. <laughs> yeah, Mary uh, Kay just posted those uh, posted that that link. That's that yeah. uh, site school. She just posted it again. Yep. So this is educators who want to know. If you want to talk quantum computing, go find another site. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's another. That'd be another fun book club. Quantum yeah. computing. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're right now we're not yet to, to quantum computing. We're we're in supercomputing, and right now um, I think best estimates for the fastest supercomputer uh, to do two fifty six encryption is still a couple million years. Uh, to figure that out on a supercomputer, quantum computing could do that in fractions of seconds. Uh, so we're not quite there. Uh, and so this is a, an illustration. Uh, actually, this is, you'll see this in one. Uh, if you go back to the book club, you'll see this from our previous book club. Uh, this is uh, by Mark Montgomery uh, in the Spectrum article. Uh, it's a very, very nicely crafted illustration, which I love, which is the reason why uh, we're using it. Uh, I'll go ahead and post the link to this uh, here as well in the chat. And the idea behind this is this, is this is sort of the troll trust protocol. So say somebody, everyone's here is working on block 91. So again, this is, uh, they're trying to figure out the solution for block 91. Uh, but say somebody wants to, to be sneaky and wants to try to corrupt and alter information in block 74. So to be able to do this uh, in, in Bitcoin setup, he would have, to, uh, this, this bad actor would have to go ahead and redo all the computations for block 74 through 90 and 91 before anyone finishes 91. <laughs> so, so, so that's sort of one of the things you start running into. You start running into, because of how much computing it takes, that because it would take so much for anyone to corrupt the blocks that the miners are all working on just solving one problem, anyone trying to corrupt this. And again, since it's distributed, once 91 is completed, boom, the whole network gets reset, boom, and then we're on the 92. And so if someone's still trying to corrupt block 74, now guess what? Now they've got to try to do that, plus the new solve before the next block gets built. So it's constantly building, constantly churning out, constantly being added up. Obviously, if it's a smaller network, if there's less people on it, you can do different things on it. And so what Bitcoin uses is they use a proof of work system. So the idea is, is that as things are solving, the chain that has the most cumulative proof of work is considered the most valid. And so this is kind of the idea of, you know, when you think about social networking, the people who have the highest upvotes or the highest, the highest likes for their comments in Reddit, the highest upvotes in Reddit or the highest star ratings in Yelp or whatever, they're considered the, the, uh, the best uh, users. So characteristics of blockchain. Um, they're distributed ledgers. So again, think of accounting. So these are transactions. These are T accounts. These are things that are set up. They record transactions. They could be purchases. They could be assets. You know where they are. They know when they are. You know who used them. You know what they're used for. You know how much they've depreciated. You know what's going on with them. They are digitally stored. So therefore, you need to have you need to have computing power. You need to have good internet. You need to be able to have cheap electricity, cheap computing power to be able to run them. They're updated regularly. So there's chronologically and timestamped. Everything is timestamped here. So you have that really, really clean, robust, 
and audible. Yay! Uh, all accountants rejoice. It's audible. Uh, <laughs> It uses very, very robust, for now, cryptography. Um, once you start getting into the realms of quantum computing, that's whenever you start really seeing really fun cryptography. Uh, for anybody who is a big cryptography nut, uh, that's when things get really exciting. Um, Consensus-based trust is another key feature of blockchain. And again, that comes from that distributed ledger. The idea is since we have so many people working on the problem, you start the system itself is looking at consensus to recognize and adjust any error. So if you have a bad actor, it's still looking at that proof, at least in Bitcoin, it's looking at that proof of work system. The other piece to it, again, fully auditable. It, everything is recorded, everything is transactable. If you have the key, uh, you'd be able to do it. <laughs> yes, auditable. <laughs> and the other thing about it is that what also makes blockchain appealing is there's a lot fewer third parties involved in blockchain. Um, one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies are very, very popular is there are less intermediaries. You don't have a bank. There's no limits on, um, on withdrawal amounts. There are, uh, there's not so many things being tracked. Uh, so there's lots of different things. There's no one limiting how much you're gonna draw. So there's lots of different things that you see uh, that are advantages with blockchain uh, that a lot of people are looking at how can you, how can you use this uh, as opposed to normal financial systems. So things to remember at its core, blockchain is a database. Its purpose is to record accurate data. So you will have a record of everything that's happened to the data, any errors or attempts to correct errors, changes, states of assets, et cetera. That'll always be recorded. Cause again, it's, it is immutable. The idea is, is you're not, is even if when you go back to try to correct it, it'll always go ahead and show that someone tried to correct it, but it'll still show what the original error was. And for, for education, it would be the same thing. It would be storing all of your student records, could easily be changed. So the database could collect anything. We already use databases already. Blockchain could be a possible piece to it. Uh, micro credentials, badging would be another area that uh, folks are exploring for using blockchain on a a more small scale, less sensitive uh, test uh, case uh, than, than actually putting in student data. So blockchain companies in Colorado, uh, there are, are quite a number of them go, uh, here in Colorado uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, we've done a lot here at, at the state to, to encourage uh, entrepreneurship in the area. Uh, coloradoblockchain.com slash companies uh, if, you're, if you're interested in seeing who's all out there. A majority of them are in financial uh, services. Uh, uh, so there's, as you'd expect, a lot of them are in the currency area. Uh, there are some lenders. Uh, there are a few, a few artificial intelligence companies that are playing with blockchain. Uh, there are a, a few other uh, big data companies that are playing around with it as well. So it's interesting to see as this landscape grows, uh, it'll be interesting to see how more and more companies start coming up around it. So speaking of education and how it applies to education, talking to your administrators. So um, some quick up things. Uh, so some quick things up front. Um, really one things with your administrators uh, as one uh you know what blockchain isn't blockchain is not the virtual currency the virtual currency is its own thing blockchain remember is the underlying technology it's what's allowing the currency to exist so it's going to be the infrastructure underneath the currency it's not necessarily a silver bullet it's not necessarily a mature technology and it's not necessarily a proven it solution so we'll talk a little bit next about where does it show up? So how many of you are familiar with Gartner's hype cycle? Well, you will be. Uh, so 
<laughs> so where is so where is blockchain now? So Gartner Group is a group that goes through and does a wide variety of these, uh, and uh, they basically set up and they 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 predict trends, they predict where things are at. And so what you're seeing now is you see the innovation trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, uh, you see the trough of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. The idea is this is when everyone's real excited about something. This is where we're all being very creative and coming up with lots of things that are happening. This is when we start trying to implement it into real solutions. This is when we get frustrated with things and we're like, oh my word. And then what happens is this is when we start figuring out what really, how to really use the technology. And this is when we start really optimizing the technology. So really what they're predicting for blockchain education is we're starting to get in that point now. Where we're just starting to figure out how we can start implementing it into, uh, into how we can start using this data, this, this, this technology solution and how it might work for, for education. And so uh, Gartner's predicting that blockchain education is still about five to 10 years away uh, from being fully implemented. Um, also, uh, here's from Provide, which is, this is the, uh, this is the technology adoption life cycle of where it's at. Uh, right now, there's, we're away from the bleeding edge. We're into that sort of lack of best practices. So again, still brand new uh, technology. Most administrators, especially your IT administrators, aren't necessarily interested in adopting brand new technology right away. I'm sure we have a few IT uh, folks in the, in the audience that can, that can comment to that uh, and some of the, the, the perils of adopting new technology too quickly. Um, and I'm sure all of us have had our experience that, especially as we shifted over to some remote teaching a little too early. And then Tom G, I went ahead and overlaid both of them. And so this is how these, these two cycles overlap. And so what you have is you have the Gardner hype cycle overlapped over the um, technology adoption life cycle. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So really what you see here is we're really in that early adopter phase. So really right now where blockchain is, is we're in that, that cusp where the first folks are now starting to really look at how do we really want to look at this technology and think about is this a possible solution that we want to see that may be a differentiator for us because one of the cool things about blockchain is that it does give a lot of control over data to the user so your students could have if you if you used it for education your students could have a lot of control over their own data because they would have the private key, which is their password, and they would have to give public keys to various individuals to allow them to access their data. And so that would take, that would necessarily take some stuff out of the hands of necessarily the college folks of, of being responsible and sort of making it easier to control all of the issues that surround protecting student data. And yes, Taylor's doing a great, Taylor will do a wonderful talk on Friday. Um, <laughs> and so that's sort of what we're looking at is, is where it's currently at. Um, and so, so that's sort of where blockchain currently is. Um, here in Colorado, we've passed, uh, we passed uh, SB 1923, uh, which is the Digital Tokens Act. And this is really one of the reasons why you've seen so many blockchain uh, companies here in in Colorado is because we've actually made it created an environment that has actually created uh, a wonderful place for this type of innovation and this type of collision to sort of create these wonderful products and and to allow folks to go ahead and interact with with this technology and try to have experiment with it and figure out how we want to use it. And to tie back into Taylor stock uh, on Friday, um, there's also this this uh, this announcement here. 
And because we're going to be like wrapping up within the five minutes, um, also wanted to say that um, Sherry Jones will be talking about open educational resources and blockchain. I know you weren't able to really get into get into that, but I tell everybody take a look at the schedule and, and mm -hmm. look at the description because both both Sherry will be talking about blockchain and OER and, and Taylor is our closing keynote and he will also be going into this. And for the participants, um, I posted our survey link so we would really appreciate the feedback that you can offer for this presentation. So I put that in the chat. Um, and again, uh, please, uh, please take time to fill that out. And now open up for uh, questions. And again, this is just uh, really I wanted to give you guys, everyone a introduction and to sort of give, give you sort of a, a precursor. So you've got some of the vocabulary out of the way and then to give you a, a, a concept of what blockchain was. So uh, we definitely have a lot more, a few more presentations that are help give you a little bit more in-depth digging. You can post your questions in the chat room if you'd like. I think they also might be able to unmute now uh, and uh, chat. That interaction in that class is, is so, you know, it is. If you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and. Uh, Uh, any breaches or frauds committed under blockchain? Um, Somebody's unmuted. Yeah, I think someone's having a, another conversation, and they got their mic got unmuted. <laughs> so, um, if the the what's what has come to that, the biggest controversy for most blockchains uh, have been when the cryptocurrency companies themselves have decided to have. Uh, the currencies, so they've made adjustments to either, you know, they've, they've, they've said one thing about the, the value or the number or the amount of currency they're going to have, and then they've changed their mind. Uh, when it comes to breaches and frauds, that's usually what most of the issues have been uh, when it comes to those type of things. The actual technology itself, uh, there have been some issues, but usually those issues have been on small, poorly distributed networks, not large ones. Um, the, the large distributed networks have been very secure. Um, ones that have had, had problems have been very, very small networks or private networks that have not had very good, that have not been uh, fully distributed. Because remember, the whole idea behind the distributed network is that you have enough users that are, that are trying to get to the next block and doing the calculations that they're doing that fast enough so that way other folks can't can't update or can't uh, go ahead and uh, corrupt that data prior to someone else going ahead and um, solving for the next block. And so that's that's usually what you see. Uh, this is what you see whenever you've seen any sort of breaches when it comes to blockchain. Hope that answers your question. Uh, it looks like you. Uh, I think that was owner who asked that question. Thanks, Clint. Thanks, everyone. Oh, it's Steve. <laughs> You're sneaking in, anonymous. <laughs> Are there any other questions for uh, Chris at this point? It does not look like any other questions at this point, Chris. So I think we're at the bewitching hour again. All right. Um, this time at the end. <laughs> and also, the, there also will be a Padlet. So tomorrow during the morning show, we're going to go over Padlets. And so I'll also have a Padlet out there that'll include these slides as well as a bunch of other, as well as some other resources 
Uh, and so we'll post that as well tomorrow morning. So uh, you'll grab that. You'll, that'll be there available as well. For your presentation today, Chris. And thanks to everyone for participating. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting now. I bet you won't cook.